Chapter 7, Edition 9, Southern Slavery. Now, strange as it seems, it was modern technology that was the impetus for the growth of slavery in the South. A young man whose name is probably very well known to you all, Eli Whitney, invented the cotton gin and patented it in 1794. That's a terrible picture of me, but it's the best one I could find. His invention of the cotton gin revolutionized the cotton industry in the United States. And prior to his invention, well, farming cotton, it required hundreds of man hours just to separate the cotton seed from the raw cotton fibers. It was very difficult and your hands were bloody a lot of the times. Simple seed removing devices had been around for centuries, but it was Eli Whitney's invention that automated the seed separation process. His machine could generate up to 50 pounds of clean cotton daily, making cotton production possible for the southern states. Now, this machine was the first to clean what we call short stable cotton, and it consisted of a spiked teeth mounted on a box revolving cylinder, which when turned by a crank, pulled the cotton fiber through the small slot opening so it could separate the seeds from the lint. A rotating brush operated by a pulley and belt removed the fibrous lint from the projecting uh, spikes. He failed to profit from his invention because there were so many patents around and he couldn't stop the others from copying and selling his cotton gin and, and the Supreme Court failed to uphold his patent. But do not despair. Eli Whitney invented a way to manufacture muskets by machine so that the parts were interchangeable. And ironically, it was a manufacturer of muskets that he finally became rich from. Interchangeable parts. What a concept. Now, for instance, if you had a gun made for you in Kentucky, and then you moved to, say, California, and something happened to this gun, you'd have to either send the gun back to the man who made it, or go all the way back yourself to have it fixed. But with interchangeable parts, if you're in California and something happens to your gun, you can go down to the, well, the local Wally World, if you will, and buy the part to fix it. And it wasn't long before the other manufactured items were able to use that concept, too. It was a beautiful concept. Of course, some of your artisans got very upset about it because they no longer had a monopoly. So, okay, now let me tell you a little bit of gossip about Mr. Whitney. Now, when we were doing the Revolutionary War, I mentioned to you something about a General Green who was in charge of the Southern colonies and the Revolutionary Forces. Well, after the war, uh, he married this sweet young thing in the South, and uh, then he died. He uh, left, of course, his plantation and everything to her, and young Eli Whitney was down there visiting, and he visited her plantation, and... They say that he invented it to help her out because he was so impressed with how she was trying to run the plantation and how beautiful she was. Uh, we don't know for sure either it was because he was impressed with her beauty or there was some hanky-panky. We do know that he was visited her plantation and when he left, he had invented this thing for her. So I personally like to say that uh, a little bit of romance was involved in that, you know. But growing cotton depletes the nutrients in the soil very quickly. So new fields had to be incorporated into the growth. And with all that new land open just west, the southern cotton farmers began to move west and take their slaves with them. Now this demand for cotton to make into cloth was growing by leaps and bounds. And after Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama did gain statehood, the population of those areas jumped from 40,000 in one short 10-year span to 200,000. And in one more decade, they were up to almost a million. And, of course, this brought howls of complaints from the cities where the houses and jobs were going unattended. The former states that were known for cotton growing were now losing ground rapidly to these new Gulf states. And in a very few years, cotton became known as King Cotton, and will remain so until the Civil War and even a little bit after. Now, personally, and I think you would agree with me, that tying your entire future onto a one-crop system, it can be devastating. But when the prices are high, you make lots of money. But a fluctuating market can be very fickle. And when prices are down, you lose your prospective shirts. But just before the Civil War in 1859, 79% of all cotton grown in the United States was grown in the Gulf area. Well, with people moving away from the southeastern states and migrating from the north to get into this new money-making process, the demand for labor grows. And, of course, we know that labor during this time meant slave labor. Now, I have a little bit of trouble the way our text author tries to tie getting Florida from Spain and the annexation of Texas and Missouri coming into the Union as a slave state and 
the war with Mexico all tied directly to the Cotton Kingdom. But again, you know, that Northwest Ordinance that was passed in 1787, right after the Revolution, it forbade slavery to exist in the Northwest Territory, which is all the land north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi. So we had, you know, in effect, put a fence around the expansion of slavery. So the slave owners only had one way to go, and that was west. So taking slaves into the new territories and states of the west is going to dominate our politics until well in the 1850s. Now, after 1808, of course, the importation of slaves was against the law. So in our domestic slave trading, and with the demand increasing for slaves, the prices, of course, went up. And never let it be said that we Americans let grass grow under our feet if there is a dollar to be made. People who had never sold slaves before get into the business. And I found a picture of a, you know, a emporium or grocery store, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Fleensware is what it's called. It sells china and glass. And, of course, he does sell slaves. But I think most of you know about Memphis. But there are also those other big firms, or as you're called in, in the text. Uh, we know about Memphis, but I think maybe learning that Washington, D.C., our lovely capital, was one of the largest ones. And it was it was quite surprising because it was condemned by slaveholders. Even John Randolph, who we learned about in the last chapter, um, they were very shocked to be condemned. I mean, he was for slavery, but didn't want to see it done in the capital. But don't forget Baltimore and Norfolk and Richmond and Charleston. And although not mentioned, Kentucky is there. And here we see an advertisement of a slave sale. This one happens to be from Memphis, Tennessee, but like I say, Richmond, Memphis, and Charleston were big sales. Slaves would be chained. And a description in your text of the product of the slave when he was purchased and then distributed and should have made your stomach curl, at least I hope. Pens and jails or anywhere the product could be safely kept. And then it would be packaged or chained and merchandise was shipped down the river to New Orleans or other places that needed labor. This is where the expression sold down the river comes from. That Mississippi River became a highway of misery. Now slaves would be prepared for the sale after they were arrived. They'd be cleaned and dressed nicely and looking their best and happy and forced to sing and dance, even if they were crying at the time, which is not a very realistic portrait of the reality of the situation. Because after being sold, of course, the slave would be branded just as you would brand cattle. There is a debate among historians and scholars as to whether you could call the slave business a capitalistic enterprise. And the name that's mentioned in your text is Eugene Genovese, a revisionist historian who happens to be a card-carrying socialist. He also seeks to interpret every historical event to his satisfaction. And I read several of his books and they all made me see absolute red. But he calls the slave business paternalistic and pre-capitalistic. While other historians do not do believe it was a financially driven enterprise. And all I can say is do you think? I can't believe anyone would go into any business where they knew they were going to lose money or even as an altruistic venture. Uh, I, I personally I think some statements just don't need to be stated. Yes, it was a money-making business. Now, Harriet Tubman, of course, mentioned and one of the few slaves you were taught about in American history. Uh, she's perhaps the best well-known of the underground, which we'll get into in another chapter or two. And during one 10-year span, she made 19 trips back to the South and escorted more than 300 slaves to freedom. And as I pointed out, that uh, she was very proud of the fact that she never lost a single passenger on her train. And by 1856, her capture would have brought a $40,000 reward from the South. Now, a $40,000 reward was a whale of a lot of money for that time. The South wanted her back, and they wanted her back bad. And during one of those 19 trips that she made in the 1860s, uh, one especially challenging journey in which she rescued her 70-year-old parents, she did go back and try to rescue her husband, but found out that he'd already remarried. Uh, if you get a chance, look her up and... Black History Women, uh, she is a phenomenal woman. And during the Civil War, she actually worked for the Union as a cook, a nurse, and even a spy. And after the Civil War, she uh, worked to help people out. Uh, she became known as Moses. And she managed to come up with enough money to buy a family home with a house her family. And 
When they were all gone, she turned her family home into a home for the aged and indigent colored people. Now, the NACW, and for you uninformed, it's a National Association of Colored Women. And it was in effect long before the NAACP came into effect. They voted to provide her with a lifelong monthly pension of $25 for all the things she'd done during the Civil War and before. And she died March 10, 1913. And she was given a full military funeral and was buried in Fort Hill Cemetery. And the women of the NACW, the National Association of Colored Women, also paid the funeral cost and purchased a marble headstone. Because she, unfortunately, she had had some bad financial times in her later years, and she was in her late 80s, early 90s, and she had to go into the home herself. But like I say, when you read about her, she's a fascinating woman. But alas and alack, for a non-capitalistic venture, uh, <laughs> the slave business was subject to the whims of the market. Early in the 1800s, before the big push for King Cotton, a slave was modestly priced at from three to five hundred dollars. And after the King Cotton craze, the prices soared as the demand increased. But then there'd be a slump and prices would drop way down. And as in most businesses, there is a rebound and it happened in the 1850s. A slave man, a slave businessman could set up, make up a 30 percent profit on his investment. But according to our noted sub-Scottish economist, Adam Smith, the law of supply and demand. Well, as the demand for more and more slaves is heard, there is a demand for the reopening of the African slave trade. Moreover, illegal or not, the Americans were making runs from Africa to the U.S. with cargoes of slaves. And of course, by this time in history, the War of 1812 is over, and England and the U.S. are again on friendly terms. So England has abolished slavery, and boy, she's putting the pressure on us big time. She thinks it's disgraceful. Now, several of our presidents during this time expressed dismay, if you would, at the increase and requested a strict enforcement of the law. But if you close your eyes and think about the coastline of the eastern United States, you see hundreds of ways a ship could unload and never be seen. There is no one place. It was done all up and down the coast and all the way into the Gulf Coast. As a matter of fact, in the 1830s, entire shiploads of slaves were arrived daily in Texas from Cuba in American ships. Now, there isn't a law in the books that it's worth anything if it's not enforced. And the law against slave trading was not being enforced. The North objected to the reopening of the slave trade, uh, oh, not on moral grounds, folks. The money was to be made in domestic trade, and if we've got foreign trade coming in, they're going to lose money. And, of course, the South objected to the enforcement of the law because they needed the slaves. And one of the reasons was the South was a bit apprehensive about the domestic market drying up. So get what you can while you can. Now, Kentucky and Virginia objected to reopen because they would lose the domestic trade. But that's the only southern states that objected. The section in text about bonds being forfeited reminded me of a Kentucky story. When the Kentucky Constitution was originally written in, in uh, 1792, they forbid slaves from being brought into the state or the territory at that time for resale. Uh, and as it became a state, you could bring slaves in for your own use but not resale. And if you got caught, you would have a $300 fine. But there's a back door to that. You, you were fined, but they did not confiscate the, quote, merchandise, unquote. So the $300 fine just became part of the cost of doing business. So the smugglers forward their bond, cost of doing business. One thing the Southerners forgot to remember, supply and demand. What happens if the market becomes gutted with slaves? Well, the price goes down, doesn't it? Hmm. Now the slave codes. Wow, I hope you were impressed with all those cannot do things that listed in your text for the slave. I was surprised it allowed them even to breathe and eat. But they had to do that because they had to work. Now forgive my sarcasm. I just did what I told you not to do, I prejudged. A very quick short listing of the do nots. They could not strike a white person even in self defense, and they certainly could not kill him. The only one allowed to rape a female slave was the master. Because if you weren't the master and you raped, you were trespassing on another one's property. 
They had no standing in court. They couldn't file lawsuits. They couldn't testify. They couldn't sign contracts. They couldn't own personal property. They had to have a pass to go anywhere or permission. And in Mississippi, you couldn't beat drums or blow horns because they were afraid it was signaled. They couldn't hire themselves out without permission. And some owners, when they were allowed to hire out, actually allowed the slave to keep the money, but others did not. And of course, they could not visit free blacks or whites. Now, if the master hears a rumor of a revolt, or even suspects one, harsh controls would be brought down on the slave's head. And it also mentions that because of the Denmark Vassy revolt, a law was passed that all black sailors were not allowed off the ships in the port of Charleston. And even a black church would close simply because of rumors that they may have been involved in the plot. No, no proof. Just rumors. The Nat Turner revolt in 1811 caused another rash of harsh rules. And by the beginning of the 1840s, the slave codes or laws were made repressive, very repressive, repressive in all the southern states. And these slave codes were meant to control the white, control the blacks and protect the whites. But with all the codes that were written, there had to be some method of enforcement. So enter the patrol. Uh, I said they were dissatisfied white men who like to be cruel, which is, mm, yeah. But for the most part, these men were landless. But if they had a runaway black slave, uh, they'd go catch him. Or if they found a black man who just was where he shouldn't be and didn't have a pass, they'd catch him. And it was the unofficial rule at the time that every free white man had to take a turn at the patrol. But some whites were just too busy or thought it was beneath them and would hire someone to take their place. Now, if a slave misbehaved, he had to be punished. Now, in your book that you're reading, uh, did you pick up on the fact that they had uh, a man had a business who would go around to the plantations and if there was a woman in charge or an old man or something, he couldn't do, the own pun do his own punishment? Uh, he was a hired enforcer, I guess you'd say. If the, the black man committed a crime against the white community, there would, of course, be a mock trial and punishment, usually whipping or branding, because you didn't want to lose the use of your investment. But there were, of course, certain crimes that required the death penalty, like killing a white man or raping a white woman or even an attempt to rebel. And, of course, it goes without saying, with no way to defend yourselves, slaves were often punished for things that they didn't even do. But when things are going well and there's no rumors of rebellions, the slave would be allowed a little bit more freedom. Sometimes with the master doing the punishment instead of having the patrol or the justice system do it. Yeah, yeah, I well remember when my children were little. It was always the neighbor's kids that were causing the problem or broke that window. It wasn't mine. And it was the same way with the plantation masters. It was always the neighboring plantation slaves that were the troublemakers, not my slaves. And we could spend an entire class really on just what was going on in the plantation. And since you've read this section, I will be brief. As I say, slaves were considered property. And as such, the vast majority of slaves did live on the large plantations. Most slave owners of five or less, usually a family, a wife, and some children, and a husband. And they even worked alongside their slaves. The exception is, of course, the big plantation with hundreds of slaves. Almost 90% of the slave owners actually owned less than 20 which kind of destroys the myth of the grandiose big houses and plantations all over the South. They were the exception, not the rule. But they did have the power. And money talks, you know. There were house slaves and field slaves. The house slave, of course, was treated much better, fed better, clothed better. Well, why? Because they were seen by their family as well as neighbors. And, of course, the more slaves you had in the house, the richer you were. The house slaves, they cooked and cleaned, they drove carriages, they cared for the young, and they acted as maids and for manservants for children. And on a lot of occasions, they would even travel with the family. So being the head of these house slaves was a position to be longed for. She was usually a female, and, and she'd have this big old ring of keys tied around her waist, and she'd have keys to the liquor cabinet in the larder. It was a very prestigious position. But if you were the cook, you had to be careful that anyone in the family of the master didn't get sick from your cooking. If he gets sick and dies, you the one that's going to take the blame, and you will probably be executed without a trial. But being a field hand, oh man, that was murder. You worked from sunup to sundown. You hoed, you weeded, you planted, and you harvest. 
Your clothes were few, your meals barely enough to survive on, and you were treated like a beast of burden. Of course, you would be encouraged to grow a garden or even catch small animals to eat, but when was their time? Of course, if you did not have to work every day, and really only during the planting and harvesting season, then what are you going to do? Well, as a master, I certainly don't want you just sitting around doing nothing. I find things for you to do. I've got a fence to repair, or you can cut my grass, or maybe there's a chore going on in the house that we need a little extra assistance with. And if all else fails, I hire you out to someone who needs help or has a need of the special skill that you might have. Now, a field hand worked under the supervision of an overseer or gang boss. And the field work was gender ordered. There were predominantly men in the field. Occasionally a young, healthy female, but usually the women were assigned the duties of watching the children, cleaning the house, making clothes, spinning cotton, or helping in the big house. Anything that they did, big house didn't have time to complete. And quilting is even mentioned as a way that they have of uh, showing their creativity, and sometimes they'd even sell it in town. Now, every scrap of material is saved and cut into squares or usable pieces, then they're pieced together with a covering in the back. I have two quilts. Uh, one my grandmother made back in the 1930s, and the other one, a little bit more current, bought it uh, 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 Wally World, made by Martha Stewart. The material is still good that my grandmother used, but the stitching is kind of loose because the threads rot a little bit. So making a quilt can express your creativity, and like I say, I've even made a couple for my kids when they were little, because they were small. They gave me something useful to do in my awful time, off times, and it used up all the clothing that I was going to be throwing away or giving away. Now, your last paragraph on page 142, at least it is in my text, is kind of prophetic. It bears repeating. Overseers were from the non-slaveholding and frequently landless group who had no interest in the slaves' welfare. They would direct their contempt towards slaves and blame the slave system for their own unfortunate economic plight. Your text calls the masters absentee landowners, and sometimes a person living in the north or even in England owned a plantation. However, most of the time, you got to realize that these plantations and owning slaves, it was a business. I don't care what Gene Uvesi said, it wasn't paternalistic, it was an economic business. And you have to keep tra have to keep track of your books. You have to make trips. I mean, we didn't have faxes and we didn't have telephones, so you had to go in person to see about making a sale or buying more merchandise. And you had to face-to-face -face meetings, so you didn't have time to be out in the fields supervising your slaves. So you had someone else do it for you. And as a slave owner growing cotton instead of foodstuffs, you had to purchase a slave's diet it was your responsibility to feed and clothe the slave. And with so much time spent on growing cotton, there was very little time for the home garden, so the necessities had to be purchased. And didn't you just love that listing? Meat, meal, salt pork, occasionally sweet potatoes and peas and rice, and on rare occasions, fruit. Of course, they were encouraged to hunt and plant, but as I said earlier, when was there a lot of time? Holidays were looked forward to because there's no work and usually a gift of coffee or material from the big house. I was pointed out, sometimes the house slaves would save things they had been given and pass them on to the people in the food play quarters. And when the cat is away, the mouse will play. When the master or the overseer wasn't looking or away, the slaves would gather in small groups to worship or to talk or to sing. Now, plantation is self-sufficient, and I visited a plantation in Charleston summer before last and was absolutely amazed at the array of buildings back of the big house, almost like a mini strip mall. There were They were three-sided and roofed and open to the front, but each little cubby hole, as you would, contained a different occupation. Uh, some would make dishes, some would make furniture, some would spin cotton, some would make horseshoes or saddles. Anything the plantation needed was made there, and if the talent was good enough, the slave would be hired out to work in town. And not strange, the uh, white artisans of town objected to the slave knowing how to do artistic work because the slave would work cheaper and sometimes even better. And your text relates the story of Dave and his pottery. I thought that was pretty clever, but there again, unusual. Some slaves actually worked in the mills and the iron furnaces and even tobacco factories, and some worked in construction of railroads. And of course, for decades, they were used as stevedores on the docks, and for the most part, 
they were paid and sometimes they actually got to keep their money but even if I was a slave on a plantation I think I'd welcome working anywhere to get out of the cotton fields now if you go onto the web and as for black inventors you're going to be absolutely blown away at the number that come up and until the 20th century credit was not given because before the Civil War it was illegal for a black man to get a patent and up until the civil rights movement in the 20th century and the 60s, black achievements were not mentioned. And I hope you were surprised to see the name of Jefferson Davis mentioned in a good light. Strange as it seems, the Jefferson Plantation was the one to be on if you were to have a choice. Because he allowed his slaves to have their own little village, if you would, and they policed the place themselves. And no, he did not believe in equality, but he did respect the abilities of the black race. Now, we already know about Benjamin Banneker and Elijah McCoy, uh, Lewis Howard Latimer, George Washington Carver, and Madam C.J. Walker, and Sarah, of course, C.J. Walker was known as Sarah Breedlove. Uh, some of those we'll get to before the end of the semester, but uh, not C.J. Walker. She's in the next section. And back to selling for a few minutes. The slave trader was looked on as a necessary evil, but no self-respecting white man would ever have him in his home. There was a social stigma to being a seller of flesh. Now a skilled slave could be hired out in businesses to town or if a plantation owner had a business he could use him in or her in and there were a lot of skilled slaves. But if you didn't have a business and the planting season was over and all the necessary mending of equipment etc was done you don't want your slave to sitting around doing nothing so you might decide to lease him out. And usually there was a broker sort of guy who knew someone who needed a slave or had an extra slave for a few, need one for a few days or a few months. So you'd rent him out, keep him busy. And that way you would also wouldn't have the expense of his upkeep. It could be quite a profitable business. And there was no social stigma to being a renter of flesh, only the selling of it. Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, no, he's not black, he's white. And I was amazed when we uh, went to the Civil War a couple of years ago that Kentuckians don't seem to know about him, which is a surprise. There is a uh, Civil War reenactment. I think it's, oh, where is it? Uh, not Sacramento. Maybe it is Sacramento. Uh, every year in May. And uh, they feature Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest started out as an orphan trying to support his family in pre-war civil Mississippi. He was taking some cattle down the Mississippi River, and he happened to be sitting next to a guy counting his money. And, well, how'd you get that much money, he basically asked. And he said, well, he's been selling some slaves. So he became a seller of flesh. And he was known for the best and healthiest slaves in the South. Just like, you know, there's some used car dealers that you don't want to have anything to do with. Well, there's some slave dealers that they would sell you slaves that were sick or dying or something was wrong. But not Nathan Bedford Forrest. He was proud of his product, if you would. Uh, he always made sure they were healthy, they were in good shape, they were strong. He never sold you anything. What he said you were going to get, you got. The best and healthiest slaves in the South, of course, they were not cheap. But when the Civil War started and he was against the war, he thought it was a mistake for the South to secede. But being a good, loyal Mississippian, he enlisted as a private. And when he got through, well, there were so many Southerners enlisting in the Civil War that they didn't have uniforms for them all. So he, being a millionaire, he sent out to supply the company with uniforms and guns and horses, thinking nothing of it. He was just his company, right? Well, the Confederate government couldn't have a private do this, so they gave him a commission of colonel. Now, this is one of the better pictures I've ever seen of him. Uh, usually, his beard's a little bit more scraggly than this. And as it says, an uneducated farm boy, he became the Civil War's most brilliant cavalry officer. He was great at tactics. He had 29 horses shot out from under him, and he enlisted as a private rose to command federal troops and Confederate troops in three states as a major general. He was the one who said, get there the fastest with the mostest and worries for killing. But his tactical genius was clouded by a savage attack at Fort Pillow toward the end of the war. And of course, he's always given credit for being the <sighs> Ku Klux Klan leader, which he was not. Another story, another time we'll get into that after the Civil War. This uh, savage attack at Fort Pillow was he was in command of a bunch of uh, troops at, and Fort Pillow was in, under the jurisdiction of the Union soldiers but they had about a third of them were black. 
and orders had been issued and issued in the Confederate government to kill any black you saw in a Union uniform. Like we get into that in the Civil War. Nathan Bedford Forrest, brilliant man. He loved to uh, bluff his way around things. He reminded me a great deal of another young American that we talked about, George Rogers Clark. He loved the bluff. Now, masters, as a rule, they didn't want their slaves sitting around and not doing anything, but there were times, and the planting season's over with, and it's before harvest, or maybe Christmas time, um, or maybe you're having an anniversary or something, and the slaves were allowed to have some time off, and they would get together and sing and tell stories, and, you know, but as a rule, the masters also wanted them to have religion in their lives, and they loved it when they but they told, slave, obey your master, and after all, it's in the Bible. But learning to read the Bible was a different story, because they didn't want you to learn about the story of Exodus and the Jews out of Egypt. So the religion taught in the white churches to the blacks was one of obedience. And a few masters didn't mind having the black minister, as long as it was monitored what he said. But if they had their own churches, or they went out in the woods, and personally, that's where I think I do my most communing with my higher power is in a beautiful wooden scene. And they'd gather and they'd worship and begin to sing beautiful spirituals. They'd sing about the injustice of slavery and, and the hopes, of course, of a better life and a rejection of the status of slavery. And there they blended the white doctrine along with their folk doctrines. And conjures was also to be found in African religious practices. For instance, turning a pot upside down as it tells you in your text. Because this pot was supposed to absorb the sounds of the worship so the white man couldn't hear. It seems strange to us, but they did believe it. And of course, it would always help to have a protective charm from a conjurer. Now, any denial of mixing the races is going to be put in the back burner because all you had to do was look out in the yard of these plantations and look at the light skinned slaves. Now, the life of a female black. If she had the misfortune to be born attractive, it was precarious, to put it mildly. She had no protection. And if she fought the advances of the white man or her son, she would bear the scars of it the rest of her life. Now, if she had a child, and was one of the lucky ones, her child would be raised very privileged. Or maybe not. In the Deep South, especially in New Orleans, uh, the mulatto females were known for their beauty and were usually kept women. I can say sometimes the master would take pride in his male child, especially if he didn't have any by his wife. And it was usually the mistress who was cruel to the mixed children. We've already gone over a lot of the justifications used by the white slave owner to own slaves and some of the ways that slaves resisted. Because they were not mindless automatons. They were they had emotions. They played mind games on the white master and they did it for decades. For instance, a female would pretend to be pregnant. Because the last thing I want to do is have her have a miscarriage, because if she has a baby uh, and it's healthy, that's a free slave for me. Or they'd read their master's emotion, or they'd steal things, and sometimes pretend to be ill, just to mention a few. Because one of the first things a slave mother would teach her children was how to stay out of the reach of the master's lash by behaving as the master wanted. So pretending to be sick or stupid may have kept a slave from punishment or having to do an unpleasant chore. And if we were in class, I would give you a demonstration about, like I said, they were playing mind games so well. I'm taking my slaves out to the field, and I've got this one slave, and he's, oh, man, he's just moving so slow. He just can't seem to get it going, and I'm thinking, that stupid black man. He gets out in the field, and what the first thing that happens is he breaks his hoe. So then he's got to go all the way back to the plantation to get another one with a stupid slave. Why is he stupid? He's delayed getting to the fields to work. He's broken the hole, so he has to go back and get another. He's killed a half a day. He doesn't have to be in the fields. Now, that's not stupid, folks. That is smart as hell. As pointed out in your text, being a happy slave was an oxymoron, because if, if they were happy, why did we need such elaborate slave codes? Of course, there were times, and we mentioned the suicides of the new arrivals, and later there would be suicides and self mutations, such as the carpenter cutting his hand or foot so he'd be useless for resale. Running away was dangerous, and for the most part, was undertaken by the young male black. 
the female would not run because of her children. Because children, it doesn't matter whether they're black or white, they have a very bad habit of crying at the wrong times or talking when they should not. And of course, there are recorded cases of a slave mother's act of killing their children to prevent them from even being in the life of slavery. And there was a Kentucky case that was used as the basis for the novel Beloved by Toni Morrison. Now, there's Toni Morrison. And if you know anything, um, maybe you saw the uh, special on television that Oprah Winfrey played in Beloved. If it's, believe me or not, I, I took me a long time to figure out, was Beloved a ghost? Was she a figment of the imagination? Or was she the actual child? It's, hmm, spooky. Some slaves, of course, would forge passes, and some would just walk away. The problem being, if they could not read or write, they just wander around for days and not know which way to go. Sound familiar? It happens in the book you're reading. Of course, there was the old standby poisoning. But if you get caught poisoning somebody, you're going to be executed. Was there any other way to resist? Certainly. We mentioned a couple last class. Your text has chosen to tell you about several, and there's a chart at the end of the chapter listing seven of the different ways to resist and the numbers killed, which, of course, we're talking about rebellions. We have several documented cases of a single slave going berserk and killing the master during punishment, usually, or when he's out in the fields. And they're always caught and executed, and sometimes by burning alive very badly. Our authors again mention the 400 slaves that were put down in New Orleans in 1811. Another 75 executed after trial. And sometimes a leader escapes and other slaves are executed for their, uh, shall we say, being in there. And George Boxley is a white man who was mentioned. Uh, he had good intentions that went wrong. And he did escape. And Gabriel's revolt is mentioned again along with the Haitian Revolution. In 1819, the territory of Missouri requested the admission to the United States to be admitted as a slave state. All kinds of objections were made. I mean, it was just like somebody threw kerosene on a burning fire. Because if Missouri came in as a slave state, it would throw the balance of power in the South, and the balance of power in the Senate to the South. Uh, why? Because every state had two senators. At that point in time, we had 22 states, 11 free states and 11 slaves. So if Missouri came in as a slave, there would be 12 slave states, which would give the South the majority in the Senate. So enter a young Kentuckian named Henry Clay, and he came up with a proposal that would allow Missouri to enter as a slave state, extend the Northwest slave pro prohibition all across the 3630 parallel, and keep the balance between slave and free states in the Senate. And for instance, they brought in uh, Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. And it became, became an unwritten rule. Uh, admit a slave state, admit a free state. And according to your text, uh, this little political wangling pushed Denmark Vassy into rebelling, but I had my doubts about that. But by the way, this is called the Missouri Compromise, and our own Kentucky Henry Clay is the one that came up with it. But the two that the Oxer spends the time on are Denmark Vassy and Matt Turner. Both of these are also discussed in American history. And you might remember them, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But Denmark Vassy, he was a slave that had purchased his own freedom, and he was working as a carpenter very successfully in Charleston. And he became, I guess you'd say, dissatisfied with the state of slave affairs, and he made plans to do something about it. He recruited skilled and unskilled black men to help him. It was a brilliant plan, because white Charlestonians are very religious. And, of course, if you're any kind of a person, all you're going to go to church on Sunday. And they all went to church on Sunday. Sunday was the big day. So they were going to wait till all the Charlestonians, especially the important ones, were in church, lock the doors, and burn the churches down. Now, Mr. Bassey had weapons and a good plan. But one of his followers, afraid of what would happen if the plan didn't succeed, all the blacks were going to be punished severely. So he told his master. So the white community knew of the plan before it happened. And as a result, 139 blacks were arrested, 47 of them were executed, including Vassie. In addition, four white men were imprisoned for encouraging the revolt. Now, I think your textbook said there was something like 9,000 blacks, invo blacks involved, but uh, I have trouble with that particular number. And this took place in 1822. Now, as this plan was throttled, 
Rumors were running all over the place about other plots, especially when a free black man named David Walker began writing a pamphlet encouraging slave revolts, and it found its way into the Deep South about 1830. And I think your text said he died mysteriously? Hmm. Hmm. Nat Turner, a very strange man. He ran away and he came back again. He believed he had been selected by a higher power to lead his people out of slavery. So he waited for divine design, a divine design, divine sign, and he received it on August the 13th, 1831. Now he gathered his men up, and I think the original estimate was, you know, he only had about 35 or 40 people in the beginning. And his followers began by killing Turner's master and their entire family with a machete. And within 24 hours, the band had killed more than 60 whites. Now, of course, eventually the Virginia militia caught up with them, and over 100 slaves were executed or killed at that point in time. Uh, 13 more slaves were hung, and three black slaves were also hung. Turner wasn't captured during this particular raid. He wasn't captured until October, and of course, there was a trial, and then they hung him. So the stories of the black preacher leading this horrendous uprising spread all over the South with some further embellishments, of course, because every slaveholder was sure they had a potential net turner in their slave quarters. It seems after 1830, there was more and more attempted slave uprisings. They all failed, of course, but not without a lot of bloodshed from both blacks and whites. Abolitionists and white radicals were writing and encouraging slave uprisings. Even the vault of John Brown, which we get into in another chapter or two, um, the white southern slaveholder was living in constant fear of a revolt on their plantation, and consequently strengthened the slave codes even more, and were very quick to punish even the slightest infraction or imagined infraction of the rules. So what are the free blacks in the north and the south? And there were some of them. That's next chapter, chapter eight, Antebellum Free Blacks.